So welcome again, everyone. I'm uh, Patrice Trasivia Presco, the Associate Director of Learning Design and Technology in the Teaching and Learning Lab at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and one of the organizers of this amazing series. Um, so welcome to our, our series. This is the last for this academic year. And this academic year, um, each of our sessions have focused on an, an aspect of how COVID has impacted women in the field. And so we are wrapping up this session, looking at the impact it's had on um, ability to publish and do research. Um, and we are gonna hear some stories from some uh, colleagues that we have on our panel today, but we also um, would love to hear any stories that um, any of our participants have that are interested in sharing. So we will um, definitely create space for that. And we also encourage you to um, interact and ask questions. And there's a few ways that you can do that. You can type your question in the chat box um, and we will be monitoring the chat box. You can also use the raise your hand feature if you'd like to um, ask a question and have the opportunity to turn that microphone on and your camera on and um, talk with everyone here. And a little bit more about the series. It is sponsored by the Women in STEM Cooperative at the University at Buffalo, which is a group of volunteers dedicated to advancing women in STEM in our respective communities. And this series is our attempt to address some of the inequities that women face and the systemic challenges and opportunities with improving student STEM education and persistence. And before I um, introduce our guests, I would just like to note that uh, we do have colleagues from over 140 different um, in, in institutions, um, 56 institutions of higher education and eight other organizations and people from four countries, one territory and 25 states. So if you are joining us today, please do take a moment to um, share a little bit about yourself in the chat box. And if you do have a thought or wondering or question to or a challenge that you have faced during the last year, um, please feel free to add that to the chat box. And with that, um, I would like to thank Becky Burke and Letitia Thomas as well, both who are at the University at Buffalo and will be helping to facilitate the session today. So we have two um, panel guests today. Our first one is Haley Olson, who is a PhD student at Harvard University, and she will be sharing um, her story with us today. And then Glenna Bett, who is um, at the University at Buffalo. So with that, I will turn it over to Haley. Oh, thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Haley. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a second year graduate student at the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at Harvard University. Um, thanks for inviting me to be here. And I'm really looking forward to hearing other people's experiences and solutions people have to the struggles that we sort of have all variably faced during the last year, especially regarding research and publication. Um, I'll give you all a little bit of an idea of, of who I am and my trajectory to as to where I how I got to where I am today um, and talk a little bit about my research and how the pandemic has affected my research. Um, and you know, hopefully sort of end on some some broad takeaways of things that have been maybe positive that we could carry forward to post-pandemic times um, that I've experienced. Uh, my story is, is one of many in my department and my lab, and I know many graduate students have, have faced different struggles and situations. Um, so I speak from, from only my experience, but uh, after I'm happy to answer any, any kind of question, and I'm looking forward to, to the rest of the conversation. Um, I am originally from Vermont, and I did my undergraduate degree in, in geology. Um, I didn't have a lot of lab experience while, during my undergraduate career, but I was interested in, in geochemistry and the sort of types, broad types of questions um, that you can explore using geochemical techniques. Um, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to graduate school, especially because I was pretty interested in, in other things like politics and government. Um, so after I graduated, I actually 
interned for a senator and worked at an ice cream shop and did a couple other things while sort of trying to figure things out. And when I knew I uh, was moving to Boston, I cold called or I guess cold emailed a, a variety of professors who did research that I thought was interesting and basically asked if they would hire me as a research assistant. Um, a bunch of people never responded. Uh, a couple said they had no funding. And one, uh, Dave Johnson at Harvard asked me to come in for an interview. And I worked for him for about a year before continuing in his lab as a, as a graduate student. Um, specifically, the, the research I do focuses on really broad earth history questions like what is the, the temperature of the ocean? What was the temperature of the ocean throughout Earth history? And how did that affect the evolution of life? Or um, what caused the oxygenation of the atmosphere two and a half billion years ago? Um, and I think those, those long sort of narrative questions about how the Earth formed uh, are really interesting. And the way that I, that I go about doing this research is um, looking at the stable isotope geochemistry of, of rocks. And so primarily I think about sedimentary rocks and, and biogeochemical cycles. So like the carbon cycle or phosphorus or sulfur cycle in deep time. Um, so I was less than a year into my graduate career when everything shut down. Um, suddenly I was working from my dining room table with a my five roommates who were also all working from home suddenly. Um, and I was taking three classes at the time and they all moved directly to Zoom with varying levels of success, which I think you know, other people can relate to. Um, and we completely shut our lab down as of March 13th. Um, we turned off instruments and machines that uh, hadn't ever been turned off. Um, and so the work that we do in our lab really does rely on the ability to generate data and use these instruments in our lab. Uh, so between March and the end of June uh, this past summer, uh, there was absolutely no data being generated. Um, and then in June, we did start back up, but with strict protocols and a pod system that allowed only one person to be in a room at a time. And we only were able to go into the lab every other week. Um, so this system, which was in place until last week, um, made it possible uh, for us to do some research, but it slowed everything way down. And it made it pretty much impossible to train undergraduates or new graduate students in the lab. Um, so new individuals haven't really been able to come in and start lab work with us, which has been too bad. Um, every, so as I said, everything slowed, slowed way down. That includes fixing machines that are broken. So just in general, lab life has been much slower. Um, there were a couple data sets that I had hoped to have finished by last summer that instead I will be finishing this coming summer, hopefully. Um, and whether or not this will ultimately affect my progress is sort of yet to be seen as I've had the benefit of being able to pivot a bit and focus on things other than lab work during this time. So I've been teaching and mentoring undergrads and taking classes and writing my PhD proposal and certain aspects of my, of my work allow for some modeling and uh, some non-lab time that I can still do research. Um, but as a lot of people are experiencing, uh, you know, general productivity has been lower, certainly, um, between my experience and the experience of other lab student lab uh, mates and graduate students in the department. Um, I've seen a lot of struggle, but also a lot of ingenuity. Um, there are some, uh, you know, some interesting conference structures that I've been to and mentoring styles that people have taken on. And so that's something that I'm uh, interested in talking about after. Um, and on the publication side of things, uh, another graduate student and, and uh, with me in my lab, and I finished a data set at the beginning of March last year. So that was very good timing. Um, 
And we were able to submit a paper at the end of the summer, um, but it took us about five months to get us to get reviews back on that paper, um, which is slower uh, by a fair bit than that specific journal usually takes. Um, and so I know that, you know, editors and reviewers are both overwhelmed by manuscripts uh, at the same time, family concerns are, are more pressing than usual. So rigid timelines and expectations in general have sort of gone out the window during this time. Um, and I guess sort of to end on a, on a positive note, like yes, my, my research has solved and publishing has been slower, um, but there have been some positive aspects that have, that have come out of this. I think um, my lab, uh, was able to attend a, a conference based in the UK in November. And, uh, you know, my field relies a lot on sharing your research at conferences and getting feedback and being able to network with people in our field. And a lot of conferences have been canceled. Um, but a conference in the UK, which normally would have been cost prohibitive, uh, cost $15. And, uh, it, instead of being exclusively on Zoom, uh, the conference used the platform Gather Town, which allowed attendees to sort of move around a room and congregate around a poster that you could actually pull up as a PDF on your screen while discussing. And so due to some hard work by, by the organizers, I think it provides a good example of that while simply transitioning to Zoom doesn't always work, um, with a little organizing, there are models that work for the future that could allow people from all over the world to discuss their research without added costs or physical challenges. Um, and then also uh, this pandemic has forced sort of a, a reckoning with mentorship and advising and academia. And I've been forced to be very open about my situation with my advisor and advisors in my department have also needed to be very understanding of the variety of research and personal life struggles that students have been subjected to. Um, something that I hope carries through to post-pandemic life, um, seeing everyone, you know, undergrads and graduate students and advisors and administrators as whole people rather than exclusively scientists or researchers. Um, so I guess moving forward, I welcome any questions about my life or my trajectory or my research. Um, or other ways that the pandemic has both helped and hurt sort of my graduate career. So I'm looking forward to that, that conversation. Um, Does anyone have any questions that they would like to pose now? I, I was, um, go ahead. Hi, um, Haley, I was just wondering, you mentioned um, you know, that you, or maybe prior to the workshop, that you kind of worked around your dining room table with your five roommates. Do they also have experience um, trying to get published during the same time? Um, were you able to at least share those um, frustrations a little bit and successes with your roommates? Yes, yeah, it's it's been, you know, I would say net pretty positive to have five roommates. Uh, isolation is impossible. <laughs> so there's that. Um, but uh, we're all in different fields. I live with another geologist, a uh, public health researcher, and a philosopher, um, among other people. And uh, we've all had different struggles when it comes to research. Um, but in the publication side of things, um, We've all experienced, you know, slower timelines when it comes to reviewers. Um, so it's been comforting um, to know that, you know, this is something that is affecting everyone in, in all sorts of fields. Um, yeah. Okay. I had one question because I, I know a little bit about applying for grants and how it, I don't know if anyone was even um, having any open. Did that affect your ability to do research, you know, or your or your advisors on trying to get grants for the work that you all were doing? Um, I have the benefit of working for an advisor who has 
historically been very good at getting money, uh, which was actually one of the considerations that I that I took when choosing where to go. Um, but I I personally did apply for a, a graduate student grant this past winter, um, hopefully to fund some field work for the summer. And so both of those things are a little bit up in the air, both that funding and also whether or not field work is even something that I could do this summer. Um, Cause right now all university related travel is uh, restricted or completely banned actually. Um, so I do know though that there are other students um, and one of my roommates, for example, uh, has had trouble getting funding and she may actually have to switch projects or advisors um, in order to remain funded, at least in some capacity. So that's definitely something that people are experiencing. Okay, well, what we can do now is bring up Glenna and then um, after her uh, discussion, we'll open it up again to see if people have additional questions. And okay, that, thank you. Okay. So Haley, thank you very much. That was uh, an awesome introduction to uh, the challenges faced by graduate students here. What I'm doing is coming at this from a little different perspective. I'm at the other end. I uh, run a cellular electrophysiology. Oh, um, somebody's changed my settings. Could could you uh, could we change the settings back, please? The host has changed the settings. Do you need? Oh, to I was I was just spotlighting. I was going to spotlight. Yes. You want me to not we'll, spotlight? We'll undo that. Thank you. That's let's let's keep with the zoom. Do you need to share though? Practical. No, I don't need to share and I don't okay. need a spotlight either. Thank you. Um, my video settings have still changed. Is that something that may be now on um, the um, user end if you want to see the gallery? No, it's view? not on my user end. It's been someone's changed my audio. My, there we go. My reset them. Um, so I'm at the other end. I'm. Uh, uh, Mm -hmm. Glenna, we don't see you anymore or hear you. Yes, I switched off my uh, video. Someone is altering my video settings. I think it's just the way Zoom works when you're talking, you become spotlighted. But no, you, can, you can leave no, your video it, off, it's fine. It, it, it doesn't do that. And um, so this is one of the things about Zoom best practices, uh, which, which we will get into. Um, so I'm at the other end, I run a cellular electrophysiology lab. I have about 20 students come through the lab a year. I run a company, so lots of teaching, writing papers, um, writing grants, all the other thing. So it's been a very interesting year. And the one thing I want to make sure uh, that I communicate, because this would be my take home message, is when we think about Jeff Bezos, his net worth or his worth increased by 75 billion this year. On the other end, we have a lot of people in food banks. The number of people having to go to food banks has gone through the roof. And this is true for uh, the scientific community too. There are some people who are thriving in the current environment and there's some people who are just unable to carry on. And I think it's a very dif difficult situation because especially if people start comparing themselves to what other people are doing. And that's something you've got to keep in mind. This, is, this situation has uh, favored some people, has hurt a lot of other people, not through anything they've done, just the situation they happen to be in. It's also torn the lid off certain people's predicaments. And that, but that's what I want to make sure is that one size does not fit all. It's very different for different people. And you have to remember that as you're dealing 
with other people who may seem in a very similar situation, but they're not. So my lab deals with uh, quite a broad spectrum of things. We're interested in cellular electrophysiology. That's the electrical activity that you find in cells. Obviously, it's very important in the heart. Everybody knows about the heartbeat. And you see it, little EKG going blip, blip. That's the kind of thing we look at. You've also got a lot of electrical activity in your brain. So almost every cell has got some electrical activity. That's what we look at. We look at how that's affected by drugs that are um, that can disrupt electrical activity in a good way or as a bad side effect. So the way we do this is we've got three main prongs. We've got mathematical modeling, which is just building mathematical models, computer models of how these things interact, how all the different electrical components act in the cell to gain a deeper understanding of how they work and how mutations affect them, drugs affect them, everything else. Mathematical modeling, it's all on computers. So computer guys, they do pretty well, actually. You can remotely log on to your computers and you can you can do a lot of the work that you need to do. Of course, the data that we get to feed into those models come from experiments, where you're doing experiments in a lab environment. You've got huge pieces of equipment that you're you're working with. You're having to prepare these cells, experiment on these cells, and uh, that, of course, that that part of the group, a <clears throat> little more difficult. If you can't get into the lab. If you can't have all the people working together to get these supplies, of course, you've got one person actually running that experiment, but you have so many people helping them prepare to get to the point of doing that experiment. That's not so good. And then we've got the engineering division where we're building a lot of instrumentation, instrumentation which helps people perform their physiology better. And of course, that somewhere in between. So I thought it was very interesting, uh, something I want to pick up on, something that Haley said about uh, struggles versus ingenuity. And a lot of people had struggles. When we first went over to lockdown, it was, ah, it was fine. We went over to Zoom and we did Zoom meetings and then we picked up on Zoom best practices, which have changed significantly over the time as people have understood how Zoom affects how you interact with other people, which is something that's very, very important. And most people don't take on board the, the Zoom um, appropriate behavior. But just going on Zoom doesn't replicate anything. It, it, it really doesn't. And what we found is that with working with such a diverse group, it really has been an insight, an insight into people's organizational skills, and I mean that in a very deep internal, how they are organized, how they perform. The challenges that are everybody having, even without the uh, pandemic. I went to a career day once in a big national organization, and they were talking about uh, work-life balance. This was a while ago. And they asked the presenter, well, wh what about children and PhDs? And, and can, you, can you do it? And the PhD student said, oh, it's, it's actually not that bad. I had, a, I had a child in my first year of my PhD, my third year of my PhD, and my fourth year PhD. Oh, a couple of sleeps was nice, but it was all right. And of course, it was a male graduate student and that this was the advice offered by a national organization is a little a little off if you are the woman having a child in your first year and your third year and your fourth year you're going to have a very different experience than the man having the child in the first and the fourth and third year and also if you're a student who is working in a lab but supplementing with a part-time job if you're a student or a junior faculty or even faculty with childcare responsibilities, and we know that the childcare has all fallen, predominantly all fallen, predominantly fallen um, on the mothers and the females. So 
the the struggles that people are having, the range of the struggles is is just unfathomable how different this pandemic has been to everybody. People are having very, very different experiences of this. And the struggles and the degree of the struggle is very different. And so the ingenuity, that window, that opportunity to have a solution is tiny for some people. If you have a child or two children or more, and you are not able to do your on-campus job that was supplementing your income uh, to help you through your student days, you're in a very different position uh, than you are if you have a guaranteed income and and you can carry on. So um, as in particular uh, instances, we're talking about grant applications and publication submissions. So those are both astronomically through the roof. The number of study sections I've had to sit on this year has been crazy. And the number of applications to those study sections has also been crazy. And this is interesting. I would be very interested to see how the uh, numbers work out. There's been a lot of data showing that when a reviewer is overloaded and has too many grants to review, they tend to mark down the female applicants. They somehow, when you're stressed, you have a lot of grants, you've got a short time to do in it uh, to do it. The the level of neutrality disappears. I don't know why. It's part of our human condition right now, where we're not really. Uh, getting rid of all those biases we don't know about, those deep biases. So with having so many applications, I'll be very interested to see how these numbers work out. Of course, if you're a woman who is preparing grant applications and you have children that you're homeschooling or supplemental schooling, that is going to affect your ability to meet those deadlines and to make the best grant submission that you can. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how this works out when we look back and we review those numbers. Um, the, the same holds with papers, but as Haley quite rightly pointed out with publications, you can obviously delay the time in which you return your review. With grant applications, that's a little more difficult because they have solid deadlines, funding deadlines, especially the federal um, the, the federal ones that uh, have their strict deadlines and their strict funding. Uh, so this is a, a very fluid situation. And as again, as Hayley noted out, the relationship between myself and everybody who's in my lab has changed. We've uncovered some issues that were bubbling beneath the surface a little bit. It's been uh, an opportunity to uh, better address everybody's needs in the round. We've, uh, it's like when you go in for a cardiac stress test and they make you exercise so you can see not how your heart is functioning right now, but how, how is it functioning when you have a little stress, when you're having um, some exercise, and what are the underlying things that we found uh, that, that you can find by putting a little stress test. This is not an unwelcome stress test, but it really has um, forced us into a relationship that that we we really take into account people's learning styles, people's working styles, and to put in as many safeguards as we can to make sure that everybody has all the support that they need, and everybody has um, the opportunity for growth and. I'd just like to echo what Haley said about some of the structures that we've put in, because when you're working in a lab, a lot of the interactions are those spontaneous, oh, by the way, kind of conversations. And they don't occur when you're all working independently, when you're in the independent silos. So I have every single person, whether I interacted with them that day or not, send a daily update. There's goals in the morning and achievements every day. It's good to make sure that I know what everybody's doing, 
but I think it's also good for the individual people to make sure that they they understand what they would like to achieve that day and whether they achieved it or not and I think that's really helped out it's helped out me a lot but I think it's helped people in just doing that daily journal it's not terribly big but there's, there's several little things like that that we've implemented they're going to keep all the way through um, but my take home message is this is is so different and if you're doing something that can easily be translated to a kitchen table, a dining room table, or, or, or wherever, versus something that cannot. And if you turn around and you see other students are doing well, they're thriving, they're the Jeff Bezos's of the pandemic, well, that's not them alone. That just happens to be their circumstance. And if you're at the food bank, that's okay but go to the food bank and get the food that you need and make sure you're getting as much support from everybody around you. This is a good opportunity that if you're identifying some problems that you need extra support, find that extra support now and continue with this even once we transition into more regular working. So I welcome any questions and discussion. Um, I had a question that maybe is for um, one or both of you. I, I know there's been a lot of discussion around extending the tenure clock because of the issues around research and publication, but also um, the realization that likely it'll be more women, especially like mothers who are needing to extend the tenure clock and then the impact that will have of the delay in their ability to you know, achieve tenure and salary and promotion, things like that versus men. Um, I just wondered if either of you had any insights into that or thoughts or, you know, experiences. Well, we've always had the opportunity to delay the tenure clock and um, we, we can't pretend this isn't, this isn't happening. I mean, one of the most important things is to address that this is a global pandemic and everything has changed. And if you think everything's going to be the same, it's likely uh, not going to be true. So this would be one of the supports that I would recommend reaching out. If you need to delay the tenure clock, do it. It's not, uh, it's, it's there for use. It's not a negative. And the more people that, if they need to delay the tenure clock that they do it, uh, the, the more accepted it becomes. This is this is one of the food bank moments. This is a support that is there, that is that can be used, and is used, even um, outside of of the pandemic. And if anybody has any discussions, you should always throw in the comment about well, well women uh, might have some medical things and some childbearing issues around the ten year clock. Make sure you have the repost that, yes, the major loss of time and use of medical resources is all the old men that far outweighs the little blip in time that you have for um, childcare and for having the children. It's nothing compared to that old, old men who are, who are taking all this time off for medical uh, purposes. Yeah, I can't, I can't speak directly towards uh, tenure in the same way, um, but I know that there are a lot of graduate students that I know who are trying their best to, to extend their graduate school experience um, and perhaps their postdoc experience um, because of the delay in, in publications and data generation and whatnot. And, and so for many people, and, and most of the people I know who are doing this are also women. Um, for many people, that will, you know, just further extend their their entire career, but is also extremely dependent on available funding and and their individual situation, um, which again, most people do not have that opportunity. And this is one of the Jeff Bezos points: those of us who have tenure, and we are secure, we're on the Jeff Bezos side of the head. We're not getting seventy-five million increase in wealth. 
but hope oh, sorry 75 billion um but we have a security that people on the other side of the turning clock don't have and that's one of the huge i mean this is not an equal opportunity pandemic it's not and we just have to start the discussion understanding that and as well as a healthcare pandemic it's also a financial crisis and that's going to mean fewer funding fewer jobs available so it's going to be unknown how that exactly play, plays out in the future but um the, the pre-tenure, post-tenure is one of those divisions. And th there's nothing we can do about it, as in people who have, you, we can't magic up money, but that's going to be a, a big problem, making sure that women are represented and are hired, and we need to have those discussions as we move forward into the best practices in hiring. Lena, when um, a woman maybe comes forward and says that she is hesitant to use that benefit of postponing her tenure clock, um, because, you know, in the future, although there will, you know, if somebody looks at her history, they might see um, longer periods. And so it might be able to be implied if she took advantage of this wonderful benefit. Um, what kind of advice would you, um, you know, one or two points to tell that person to, to, you know, say what you did, you know, take advantage of it. Is there something concrete that somebody that like me that I can say to a person besides, you know, you should do it, so do it. What kind of advice do you give me? Well, the advice would be that I wouldn't tell them what to do. Um, because everybody's situation is so different and there are so many of those split points here. If, if you're in a field, if you're in bioinformatics or something and you're processing everything and one of the, so, so the flip side is one of the issues with women, if they're going to apply for a job, if they're going to apply for a promotion, they feel they have to be 100% there whereas men will apply when they're 50, 60% of the way there. And so you definitely don't want to tell people not to go for it, especially tell women not to go for it. You are probably a lot better than you presume uh, you are. Um, but if you need it, and that is such a case-by-case -case basis, if you need to delay your tenure, do it. The... Um, grant reviewing bodies I've been on, they are becoming more and more diverse and they certainly accept uh, statements including um, childcare issues, um, other things that are credible, reasonable, not just I kind of lost my way for a little bit and I wasn't sure what to do. I've even hold, heard those ones in there. <laughs> that people do that. Men tend to, men said, tend to do that one. But um, it's the grant reviewing processes are trying to be a lot better at having equitable distribution of funds and to uh, assess the whole person. And so if you spend an extra year getting your tenure, it's not going to change it. It's, um, I would say it's not going to change your life. Um, but it's, I, one of the things is I've never, I've never actually seen anybody count up the years between, um, get, getting tenure seems such a big thing on the way up there. But on the other side, nobody ever counts. When did they get their position as assistant professor and when did they transition to associate professor? I've never, never seen that ever reviewed other than in the tenure room. And once you've got tenure, then, uh, then I've never, never seen it. Mm -hmm. you know. I guess looking at it from a professional, I'm a professional staff and not a faculty and on hiring committees, that is one of the first thing that, um, 
that is often looked at on afternoons. Well, they have this big block of empty time. Um, what happened there? And, and um, if you're on those hiring committees, I hope you use that opportunity to make sure that you're addressing all the uh, applicants equitably. Mm -hmm. But I, it's something that I think people look at. Well, um, that's on the sciences, in the medical field, not an issue, not an issue at all. Never been, never been mentioned. If you have big gaps in your time, so long as you can account for everything, mm -hmm. you, you can go out into industry, you can come back, you can go work on this subject, you can work. Um, people have the most circuitous routes to getting to where they are, and it's not, um, it's not, it's not a challenge. I mean, I've done mm -hmm. about uh, seven, eight study sections this year. Never heard it mentioned once in a negative way. Mm -hmm. We've heard somebody say, oh, they've been, and we've heard, we've had people say that um, people talk about things that may have appeared strange that they've gone to the diff different cities and it just goes, they, they may mention that they were following a spouse and that's been that's been fine uh it's in the medical field it's and in science field but it's not a problem it's it's well recognized i had a this may fall under a support question but i know uh, like um haley you mentioned how you know when the pandemic started you were in your dining room doing your research you know and i think one of the Equity, equity issues we've seen is, you know, now students or faculty are all over the place. They might be somewhere rural where they have, you know, poor broadband access, you know, maybe they don't have Wi-Fi, maybe the only device they have is a tablet or a 13 inch screen. And I know um, everywhere from K through 12 to higher ed, there's been, you know, an effort to like ship equipment to people, you know, different things like that. So I was wondering if like faculty and graduate students, like how they're handling and navigating some of those issues. Um, yeah, I mean, speaking from my department, I know um, many graduate students who've gone home to be with family or have moved for a variety of reasons. Um, I know people who are, there's a graduate student in my department who is, sleeping from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. local time because she's in Asia um, to, in order to stay on, on, on time, on Eastern time. Um, and I know people who've gone to other countries or, or their homes and have had struggles with internet and other connectivity issues or family health problems, you know, like this is also a health pandemic. Um, so that's a real concern. Um, in general, in my department, um, I'm not sure what exact conversations those graduate students had with their individual advisors, but uh, those are situations that have persisted. And so I assume that, that they've been communicating with their advisors and their advisors have been um, understanding or at least accepting um, and hopefully supportive of, of all of their situations. Um, with the expectation, I think that when this ends, uh, we will largely all be returning to, you know, offices or in-person learning. I think, um, especially with those with those situations, I don't think that anyone, um, you know, they they talk about the, some of my my roommates, for example, work in the biotech industry, and and some of their jobs may be. Um, work from home permanently or something. And uh, in, in many ways, I think the, the research community in my, in my department, uh, that will not be the case. Um, so I think in general, advising has, has been supportive um, in my department, which I think is really crucial um, and is also uh, dependent on the type of research that those people are doing. Like largely those people are modelers and not lab scientists. Whereas I've had to work from home, but I'm tied to uh, being able to go into my lab when I have the opportunity um, in order to generate more data. So I don't have that, 
that same ability to sort of move around freely. So we've done our best to make sure that everybody has as much ability to access any equipment that they need. So of course, remote logins, and you can do that even on the big mainframe computers. Um, this, the big equipment, you can't take big pieces of equipment home and set up uh, have oxygen tanks and nitrogen tanks and all kinds of stuff. You wouldn't have room on the dining room table. It would take up the whole dining room. Um, so you can't do that. But I want to make sure everybody's aware of the uh, work visa programs. This would be the other side of the Jeff Bezos line. You can go and live in Barbados for a year and work remotely from Barbados. They set you up with uh, all kinds of wonderful things. Is this true for Antigua, um, various of the Caribbean countries? So there are people who are working remotely, not from their dining room tables, but from some lovely place in the Caribbean. So their pandemic experience is different. And they're not the people that are obviously waiting at the food bank because they've lost their job to, uh, to support them while they're doing some studies. So again, it's, uh, it's very different from the experimentalists to the analytical, uh, mathematical side of things. And we have to respect that difference and not expect to do the same amount from the, the experimentalists as we're doing from the, the modelers. And just to add and, and sort of to relate it back to the, the last question also is in, in moving forward, um, the inequity that is dependent on, on your personal life, but also the type of research that you do um, in people's experiences will, you know, have, have a long-term fallout in that people who need data, need to generate data, who don't have data will have fewer publications um, over time. And my hope is that, you know, in, in the hiring process, when this sort of cohort of graduate students moves forward, uh, people will <laughs> remember the pandemic uh, and uh, remember that uh, there's going to be a, a whole generation of grad graduate students who've been and you know everyone pre tenure postdocs whoever um, who have been differentially affected by the pandemic and I hope that is a a question that people ask and our and students or applicants are allowed to justify. So I I like to allay your fears right there and then because obviously when when we review. Um, when we're on a study section for reviewing applicants for pre-doctoral, post-doctoral and junior faculty awards, we, that exists right now. If you've got some kind of statistician coming in who's just crunching the numbers, and I don't mean that in a negative way, it's an important thing to do, but if you're just crunching numbers for existing data sets that you're, you've got access to, you're going to have a lot more publications than someone who's there doing some complex gene editing and, and other kind of stuff. So that's already baked into the cake. And I see no problem with that going forward, understanding the difference, at least in sciences and medicine, which is the study section I serve on, um, that we there already is such a, a, a large difference. In the, you, you get some people turning up with hundreds and hundreds of publications that they they've hardly contributed to. And then you get those few solid publications from somebody else and they're weighed equal as equally productive in, in terms of should we award them this, this grant, this fellowship, this money. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think I have future facing question. Um, sometimes uh, like in the, colleagues that I've been discussions with that are in more of the IT world talk about a framework of, you know, um, what do we want to restore? What do we want to see evolve? And what do we want to see transform? And so I'm just wondering if each of you have any thoughts, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, like, what do we want to keep 
moving forward and what do we hope you know evolves or is entirely reimagined I think from my standpoint, um, the heightened communication between student and advisor, I think is something, um, and sort of the broader acknowledgement of people's different backgrounds has, has broad implications for equity and inclusion and belonging within departments. And I think that should very much stay. Um, I think as, as Dr. Bett said, it's, uh, it's hard to have those sort of incidental conversations that are really that are really crucial to a lot of research and a lot of collaboration. And so I think in that way, being in person and, and moving around the lab with, with people is, is something that I would like to return to. Um, and, and something else is that um, I've been able to, to mentor a, a, a currently four undergrads um, who, aren't able to be in the lab to do research. Um, but because of Zoom and their location all over the world, um, we've been able to sort of creatively come up with projects that uh, they're interested in and, and offer some, uh, some more tailored research experiences. Um, and I think moving forward that, um, interest and, and, and concern with uh, mentoring and especially undergraduate students, um, I would like to, to carry forward um, rather than, uh, you know, uh, I would only otherwise be able to have one undergraduate in my lab who I would have to, you know, train and, and do all of the lab work. So um, I've been able to, to connect with more people in that, in that regard. So um, one of the things I think I mentioned previously is that I'm going to keep the daily reflection from everybody. Just their little, what are you going to do? What did you get done? And I, I've, I've, I like that a lot. <laughs> um, now, the University of Buffalo, one of the things that I think we keep is the University of Buffalo is on three campuses, north, south, and downtown. And my nightmare days were three campus days when I had to be in all three different campuses. And now we've shown that you can have a Zoom meeting and you can have a Zoom mixed with in person. Um, I'm not showing up. I'm going to demand Zoom access to uh, various meetings. Becky's always been wonderful, Becky Burke, has been about facilitating phone-ins and, and everything else to meetings. But now that the technology is there, we've got all the uh, facilities definitely less time traveling and that's true I, I mean i'm echoing what Haley's saying here about the opportunity to go to other meetings and interact with other people and that's that's been great as a supplement because the one thing is that i do miss is the in-person conferences even though it's a pain in the neck to go traveling around and wherever it is they're holding the meeting but again it's those asides it's those little oh by the way those con conversations that you don't have in in zoom and you don't have on zoom you happen to be next to somebody getting a cup of coffee and then you start talking about things that doesn't happen in zoom you don't happen into a little breakout room and start discussing nothing which sometimes end up, up ends up in a, in a very productive area of uh, of science. So yes, it's a mixed bag. Mixed bag. Be nice to see people again, though. Be nice to hang out. It really will. <laughs> I'll add on to that also is uh, just briefly that. Um, Harvard this year got rid of the, um, the GRE, the, grad, the graduate schools, um, or some of them at least, um, which has been shown in many ways to be uh, a test that uh, is full of inequity um, and is not representative of 
people's abilities. Um, and so some of those conversations that have been uh, stimulated by the, the pandemic and people's varying access to technology, I think, um, again, moving forward, uh, hopefully, you know, the GRE sort of ceases to exist altogether uh, and we're able to come up with ways to more holistically uh, judge people's experiences. So uh, we have to be very careful about that because I'm sure you're aware of how Harvard's admissions transformed when they went to more holistic admissions and the number of people from a poorer socioeconomic background getting in actually declined. They, uh, they're, when you're allowed to make wishy-washy decisions, sometimes it is not that well informed and the actual profile of the admitted class wasn't uh, the most equitable. You were choosing people for reasons other than GRE and once you start doing that, they were not using that option as best they might. Mm. I, I am aware of some of the, the troubles that the, um, the college with undergrads has had in admissions processes. Um, I know that uh, in our department specifically, um, getting rid of the GRE um, and focusing more on, um, you know, letters of recommendation and research experience, et cetera, has actually, um, broadly allowed the department to, to invite more diverse candidates in. Um, but that said, we are a, a small department um, compared to others. So uh, where some people can, can sit down um, and carefully go through things, I know that a lot of departments have to sort of have a, a triage system. And I think what you're getting at is, is totally true and, and gets at something that I think you mentioned before that uh, with the grants that um, women are being marked down a little bit more than men when, uh, when deadlines are approaching. And I think um, we tend to rely on our uh, biases, especially when we don't have other uh, systematic metrics to rely on. So I think in general, the admissions process uh, needs, needs a hard look. Um, and I'm hoping that the, the pandemic in general um, helps encourage that. It wasn't actually male versus female that was the issue. Um, you can go, the, the Harvard's admissions gets studied inside out. Um, but think about what you just said about letters of recommendation versus GRE. Letters of recommendation can be very difficult to come by if you don't have access to someone who can write you a nice letter of recommendation. And that is something we do come across in the um, who gets awarded the fellowships and things. You can get very nice letters of recommendation. And then if you have someone who's come from a, a more non-traditional school, a little different group, they might have a letter from someone who's not used to writing letters of recommendation and so doesn't write it in the same way as someone who's used to writing letters of recommendation for a lot of people. Um, so that it's not, letters of recommendation versus GRE is not as equitable as it might seem because it really depends on who's writing that letter and if they know how to, to write a good letter of recommendation. And the, there were some issues if the um, uh, going to a more holistic approach. Just have to be. We all have to be very careful. It's very difficult, but we want to get best practices. Um, but you, you do have to take a holistic approach, including how uh, how they got this letter of recommendation, how they got on the letter, the ladder, how they worked their network. If you're if you're born into a family with a lot of network, that you're going to just start off in a different place than if you're bo born in a place where there is no network. 
and your school doesn't have a network, it doesn't have a lot of people going to Harvard or any other college, or um, so we have to we have to be very careful about this holistic approach. Make sure we're actually making it equitable. Yeah, yeah, I I definitely agree, um, and I I think that there right now there isn't a you know a perfectly equitable um, admissions process option that we have right now. And I think, um, I, I don't have the answers to that. Um, the, the GRE as a test has been shown to disproportionately, um, you know, buoy applications, uh, of, of people who are, you know, predominantly white and, um, of, uh, certain a, a higher socioeconomic status but that said as you as you said uh letters of recommendation probably do the same um Ooh, so yes. it's unclear uh you know what the best combination is um but i think at least understanding the data behind each one of those application uh components is a good place to start and i think a lot of people have been sort of blindly using these as as ways to whittle down the, the field without taking a harder second look. Yes, and it's all, uh, we have to keep people's feet to the fire. We have to keep them honest. We have to make them say, uh, remind them of, of the differences and the, and the very different experiences that people are having in the pandemic. And we just have to keep on reinforcing that and reinforcing that um, as best we can. And that's easier for, people at different stages in their career so I think that everybody who is in a hiring meeting or in a fellowship meeting uh, to decide the study section who's going to get the money it's it's really a big burden on us to make sure that we keep on talking about this even once the pandemic is over it's not going to be over for people who have um, for some people who've had catastrophic consequences this year versus people who've, who've just basalized it and, and come out quite well on the other side. So it, it, it's really important for us to keep that conversation going and make sure that we're doing the best that we can to, to really interpret um, this period of time for people. And people just need to be, mind if, oh, sorry, go ahead. And students, it would really help out if students and people and everybody else just not not in a uh, anything other than just stating the facts of going. This was the consequence, and um, I I faced this. Obviously, if you weren't access to didn't have access to your lab, that's going to be pretty apparent. Yeah, you don't have huge pieces of equipment at home, but anything that can help people identify where you are on the range of. Uh, outcomes from, from the pandemic. That would really help a lot. I was just going to say, I know we're, we're starting to run out of time, so I was wondering if you minded if I mentioned a story from um, a graduate student here at UV, who I asked if she would be interested in, in um, joining us, but she was a little shy. Um, but she did mention that she had done undergraduate research and um, she's going to participate in the STEM for Everyone um, event that we have through the WISC um, where people can, students can talk about their research and try and explain it to a layperson. So that way it gives them a chance to really help to get their elevator pitch ready and just to be able to describe it if they need to. Um, but what she was saying was she was encouraged by the professor that she has in grad school to do that. But she on her undergrad research, but she couldn't do graduate research yet because it did involve being in the lab. So what she did to um, continue was she pivoted to do her coursework versus her research work. So that was what she had to do. Um, will that delay her? I don't know because of being able to pivot that way, but it definitely did affect her um, and it will affect what she does in the future. Um, but I just thought it would be nice to kind of get that perspective too. It's not me, but um, I have a daughter who's, who's in um, meteorology and she's 
happily doing crunching data from her couch. But, you know, like you said, it's the Bezos versus um, the food bank. So it just depends really on your major and, you know, your research path, so. Thanks, Becky. I was, one, I was at, um, going to ask if anyone else before we wrap up has a story they would like to share, um, either either personal or just a, a student or faculty member that you know. I have a quick question for Judy. Judy, um, has your committee for the IEEE been able to meet and do some of the things they normally do during the pandemic or? How have they been dealing with that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, it took us uh, surprisingly since we're, uh, we all have or some sort of engineering background, it take, did take us a little while to really get with the program. <laughs> uh, we managed to have our, um, our monthly board meetings with very little problem because we were offering that um, at least the dial-in option to people all, you know, prior to the, the big shutdown. But we finally started having uh, virtual monthly meetings, technical meetings. And the thing that we discovered to our great delight was that it was so much easier to arrange for presenters uh, because we could actually bring people from out of town, uh, whereas previously it involved support from our national IEEE in the way of paying for travel expenses and then also for us to pay for travel expenses locally. I'm with the IEEE Buffalo section and uh, we, we also depended on the speaker sometimes doing a graduate talk at the university and the university also helping with uh, the expense. But with the virtual meetings, we've been able to have speakers from California do a presentation and then to also um, co-sponsor. So we've co-sponsored presentations with other sections. I'm doing one with the New York City on Monday. And um, we've, we've been able to actually also have um, North American conferences virtually. I never would have gone to a conference, but it's so much easier. And I always say, some of my friends don't like the Zoom thing, but I always say, hey, when the meeting is over, you're home. You know, you don't have to get in a car and drive and find a parking space and everything. So for us, it's actually turned out to be a beneficial thing as far as uh, our professional group goes. So that's just my input. But I enjoyed this presentation today. It gives me a, a different perspective because I'm not in the research or educational field. I didn't even know what you were talking about, uh, extending your tenure or I, I was writing this down. I said, I have to look this up or I thought somebody said my hearing isn't good with sanitizing, but I don't know. I, I, yeah, but I got it. Thank you. I truly enjoyed the presentation. I can explain tenure to you, Judy. But that's interesting when you talk about what you want to take afterwards, because um, I'm in the Gender Institute, and we have had a, a burgeoning of attendance because people don't have to try and get to us. And also our space where we hold some of our things holds 13 people. So it would be difficult to get those 50 people into that small space. Mm -hmm. So, but the challenge going forward is gonna be, we wanna be able to continue to have that Zoom ability to get people to be able to attend or you know 
be willing to attend, but it also had that in person. So you get that anecdotal, you know, by the way, oh, what are you working on it? Oh, how about this? So, and I've got plans <laughs> involving yeah. webcams. <laughs> the challenge has been to, uh, they encourage us, if you do co-sponsor a meeting, is to make sure, try to make sure you're all in the same time zone because we've had issues with a meeting being in central and people from the Eastern time zone. And once people arrive like an hour early, <laughs> so then you have to sit in front of the screen or do you know other things. But anyway, I, I digress. Thank you so much. I truly enjoyed this. Actually, Judy, I think um, the idea of time zones is one of those benefits that this pandemic is giving us is that um, I have been <clears throat> communicating with people all over the world. And, and yeah, there's been a couple meetings that I've had the wrong time zone in my calendar. Um, but I've been learning a little better about how to set those um, things up. But it, that's something that I think, um, you know, I try to in my mind, sometimes I have this, you know, little column, you know, some of the really great things that have come out of this pandemic. I think for me, you know, that list is pretty darn long. And, um, you know, being able to communicate with people in different countries and different time zones within our own country has been tremendous. And so as far as trying to restrict a meeting to only be in a certain time zone, um, I would actually, I would want to see the opposite. And um, I am a little disappointed that one of the groups that I've been communicating with used to meet only in person in New York City. And now they're extended throughout New York. And it's like, oh, I hope that they learn about that high flex modality that um, I'm an instructional designer. So I try to help faculty understand how they can have classes during the pandemic in both the um, Zoom format that we're doing now and in the face-to-face -face format that has so many other beautiful benefits. Um, you know, how can we bring the boast of both best of all of these worlds together? And I hope that once we're back to or past what we call this pandemic period now, I hope that our professional development can kind of get that high flex modality together. And we're all learning all of this stuff together. So that's kind of nice. Um, we're all new. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today, and especially Haley and Glenna for taking the time to share your experiences. And uh, we will be sending out information about the next academic year, which is even hard to think about at the moment. <laughs> at the moment. The recording. Yeah. 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 In the recording. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you everyone. Have a good rest of the, your day. Thanks for thank having you. me. Thank Talk you. Later. Bye. 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 Bye.